morning, folks. Good to see you. Welcome to our topics class. Last week, we began a new series on the rapture of the church. The series is entitled Every Verse in the Bible on the Rapture. And we saw last week what Jesus had to say about the rapture. And starting today, we're going to see what the Apostle Paul has to say about the rapture. So let's look to God in prayer as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, as we consider this timely subject, this important biblical subject, the rapture of the church. Lord, help us to have our minds cleared of all of the things of this world and the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. And may we just focus on you and on your precious word. So bless now we would pray and give us uh, uh, open minds and hearing ears and understanding hearts and teach us by your Holy Spirit, we do pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to ask you if you would open your Bibles, please, to the third chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3. Every verse in the Bible on the rapture. Last time we saw what Jesus had to say about the rapture. And it's an interesting fact to uh, just file away in your memory bank someplace that every one of the epistles except two talk about the rapture. The two exceptions are the book of Philemon and the book of 3 John. Every other epistle talks about, in some place rather, talks about the rapture. Now there's actually four other New Testament books that do not talk about the rapture. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You won't find any reference to the rapture there. And the other book is the book of Acts. And that's what we ask you to turn to, to Acts chapter 3. So only six books of the uh, New Testament do not mention the rapture. So in other words, we could say 21 of the 27 New Testament books, someplace or other, talk about the rapture. And we're going to go through the New Testament and see every single verse that mentions the rapture. Now, in Acts chapter 3, we said Acts is one of the books that does not talk about the rapture. I want you to see the difference in Acts chapter 20, uh, in Acts chapter 3 here, uh, as opposed to the other verses that we're going to look at. Starting with verse 19 of Acts chapter 3, Peter says, Repent there ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The times of refreshing that he mentions there is the kingdom age. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The earthly millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter is telling the nation of Israel here to repent, be converted, have your sins blotted out, so when the times of refreshing are going to come from the presence of the Lord, when the kingdom is set up, you'll be part of it. And then look at verse 20. He says, now... If you repent and if you are converted, your sins are blotted out, like he says in verse 19. In verse 20, here's the result. He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. He said, Jesus is going to come back. Why is he going to come back? He's going to come back to set up his kingdom. That's the times of refreshing in verse 19. Verse 21, whom the heavens must, heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. That's, a, that's another name for the kingdom. In verse 19, he calls it the time of refreshing. And in verse 21, the times of restitution of all things. This is written by Luke. And Luke was a doctor. And he uses a medical term here, the restitution of all things. It's a medical term. And it means to a complete restoration of health. And this world, this planet, is going to have a complete restoration of health when Jesus comes back, the kingdom is set up, and the curse is lifted. And um, it goes on and says in verse 21, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. God never spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began about the church. God never spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began about the rapture of the church. But he did speak by his holy prophets since the world began 
of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, it, and when Peter is, te is teaching the, this to the nation of Israel, he says, you repent and God will send Jesus back. In other words, the kingdom was still being offered to Israel and that offer has been postponed. It is no longer in vogue today. And I want you to contrast this with what Jesus said concerning the rapture. In John chapter 14, where Jesus spoke about the rapture, that's the only time during his earthly ministry in which he spoke about the rapture. And he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Notice the difference. Contrast that with what Peter said here in Acts chapter 3. He says, you believe, you repent, you get saved, and God's going to send Jesus back to you. But Jesus, talking to the disciples, he says, I'm going to go away, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back and get you and take you away with me that where I am there you may be also that's in heaven. He's talking here about the rapture. Now it's very important to understand that when Jesus spoke these words he was only talking to the 11 disciples. Notice I said 11 disciples. There were 12 but Judas was not there. Judas had already gone out. And so this was nobody but believers in there in that upper room. And this is the only place during his earthly ministry that Jesus talked about the rapture of the church. The only time during his earthly ministry. Now, he did mention the rapture a number of other times, about five more times, in the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. And this is what we covered last week, where Jesus is talking to the believers, telling them about the rapture of the church, and then reminding them in the book of Revelation, he says five different times, behold, I come quickly. And so that was the only mention by Jesus of the rapture of the church. If anybody tells you that the rapture is found in Matthew or Mark or Luke, uh, it's just not true. It's not there. Only in the Gospel of John that one time. And then again in the book of Revelation did Jesus talk about the rapture. Now we're going to go from Jesus and the rapture to Paul and the rapture. And since Paul wrote many books, 14, we believe 14 books of the New Testament, we're going to see, see a lot about Paul and the rapture. And today we're going to look at the book of Romans. So if you would please turn in your Bibles now to Romans chapter 2. We're going to see what Paul told the church at Rome concerning the rapture of the church. So we're going to be starting out there in chapter, uh, chapter 2 of, of Romans. He, in Romans he mentions seven different times about the rapture of the church. The first one is in the 16th verse. It says, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Notice he mentions a day there. A day. What day would that be? Well, that's what the Bible calls the day of Christ. And the day of Christ means the rapture. He says, in the day, the day of Christ, what's going to happen? God shall judge the secrets of men's hearts by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now this, we're going to see, is a good thing. But in the same chapter, you back up to verse 5, we read about a different day. In verse 5 we read, uh, uh, But after the hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day. What day is this? It says the day of wrath. That's the day of the Lord. The, the day of the Lord is Jesus' second coming. The day of Christ is the rapture. And it's important to keep those two days separate in your minds. The Bible says to rightly divide the word of truth. So the day in verse 5 
is, uh, is not the same day as in, is in verse 16. Two different days. Verse 16, the day of Christ. Verse 5, the day of, uh, the, day of the Lord, or, or the second coming. He says that after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Revelation is mentioned there. The revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ. That's at his second coming. Every eye shall see him. Revelation 1-7 tells us. So these are two distinctly different days. And just as verse 16 is a good thing, verse 5 is a bad thing. That is, it's a bad thing for, for lost people. And so um, uh, both of these days, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord that are mentioned here in, Ro in Romans chapter 2, um, uh, both of them are warnings. Verse 16 is a warning to save people. Verse 5 is a warning to lost people. Look at all the things connected the, the verses that precede verse 5. You have in verse 1, inexcusable. And also in verse 1, thou condemnest thyself. In verse 2, the judgment of God. And verse 3, thinkest thou that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. In verse 4, the, the, it says, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Verse 5, the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Verse 6, who will render to every man according to his deeds. These are all warnings to lost people. But whether it's the warnings of verse 5 or the warnings in verse 16, they're both written to church members. They're both written to church members. Their, verse 16 is written to Christians as a warning concerning the judgment of the believers. The believers are going to face a judgment that's at the judgment seat of Christ. Now this is a good thing, and we'll explain that in just a moment. But verse 5 is written to unsaved church members concerning judgment of the lost, and this is a bad thing. And you say, well, how, how can there be uh, church members that are lost. Well, folks, you study the scripture and you find out that there were multitudes of church members that are lost, professing Christians that are lost. But before we consider that, let's consider verse 16, the day of Christ. He says in verse 16, the day when God shall judge the secrets of men's heart by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. You say, why is that a good thing? Well, if you notice at the, right near the bottom of the first page of your note sheets, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. This is talking about the same day. It says, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, that's the rapture, until the Lord come who both <coughs> will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. God's going to reveal some things nobody knows about. Christians that have done things for God. Nobody knows about them. They don't go around bragging about what a great servant of God I am. They don't go around telling people, oh, you should see what I do in my spare time. You should see how I serve God. Th that kind of stuff doesn't go on amongst real believers. They serve God. They don't go around bragging about what, how great they are. They, but at the judgment seat of Christ, those hidden things of darkness are going to be brought to light. And the verse goes on and says, And will make manifest the counsels of the heart. And then look how that verse 5 ends. Every man shall have praise of God. Every man shall have praise of God. Every single Christian. God is going to find something to praise you for. He's going to find something to praise you for. Uh, if you're saved, that's at the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to find something to, to praise you for, something to uh, honor you with. Uh, there's going to be something in everybody, every single believer. So this is a good thing, but it's also a warning. Warning to church members, both saved and unsaved. 
Now you say, why would Paul write in a church epistle a warning to lost people? Now, not only did Paul do that, but other people did it as well. Why would he write warnings to lost people in a church epistle? Well, the answer is because there are lost people in churches. Church members that are lost, no more saved than, 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 than the devil is saved. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. He's talking to church members here. And one of the great things about the King James Bible, the King James English, I should say, is the personal pronouns. The personal pronouns that start with Y, ye, you, your, always refer to, uh, it's, it's always in the plural. The personal pronouns that start with T, Thee, thy, thou, thine. That's always singular. Now in this verse here, three times we have the personal pronoun ye. We have it whether ye be in the faith. Uh, actually we have it four times. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves. How that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates. He's talking there to the whole church. That's a plural, those are plural terms. To the whole church, he's telling the whole church, examine yourselves whether you're saved or not, whether you are really in the faith. To church members. Now it's way back in the first century. From the first century to the 21st century, there's unsaved people in churches. Jude wrote about them in the epistle to Jude, the fourth verse. He says, certain men crept in unawares. Where did they creep into? Into the church. They crept into the church. And they were, of, were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men. Ungodly church members? Absolutely. The Bible talks about them way back there in the first century. Now, <clears throat> they, they do two different things. And there's two different kinds of churches that they come into. The first thing that they do is within Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches. They uh, turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. That's the first thing. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. You say, what does that mean? That's the teaching that I'm saved by grace. Well, that's biblical. We're saved by grace. And because I'm saved by grace, I can do anything that I want to do. I can live any way I please. I can just live the most ungodly, immoral life that I choose to live, and it's okay because I'm under grace. That's taking the grace of God and turning it into lasciviousness. We have some in this church that do that that believe that, and woe unto them. They're gonna get a big surprise. That's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. I can go out and I can commit fornication. I can go out and I can uh, get drunk. I can go out and I can shoot dope. I can go out and I can do all these things that please the flesh and are anti-God and anti-Christ. And it's okay, we're all under the grace of God. Don't you believe that for a minute? The book of Romans also tells us that shall we continue in sin that, that grace may abound? God forbid. The Bible says, God forbid. Don't, don't live that way. A person that lives that way has taken the grace of God and trampled upon it and turned it into lasciviousness. The second thing doesn't happen so much in Bible-believing churches, but happens in the liberal apostate churches. The, last, the, the second thing here is denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You know you can go to most any church, any building that calls itself a church, and you go to the pastor and you say, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh? And they will tell you no. They've gotten so liberal and so apostate 
that they no longer believe in the deity of Jesus Christ or the death of Jesus Christ as a propitiation for our sins. They no longer believe that or preach that and laugh at us because we do believe it. And, you know, oh, those, those Bible fundamentalists, it's, you know, we've gone beyond all that. We asked um, a liberal pastor one time, do you, do, you preach, do you preach that you must be born again? He says, oh, no. No, he says that was back there in the first century because the people were pagan. He says, but we're all Christians now. You don't need to preach that anymore. There's a pastor church that said that. What did Jesus say about unsaved church members? Revelation 3.20. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And folks, he was not standing at the door of your heart and knocking to get in like you learned in Sunday school. He's standing at the door of his own church, knocking to get in. Jesus is on the outside. Church is going on on the inside. And Jesus is left outside and knocking at the door to come in. I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Lost church members. They, they existed back there in the first century. The late B.R. Lakin, he said that he believed that in fundamental Bible-believing churches, he said, I believe about 75% of the membership is unsaved. That's a startling figure. 75, I don't know what he based that on. I don't know where he got that number, if he just pulled it out of the air or what. But he said he believed that about 75% of the membership was unsaved. He was talking about Bible-believing churches. He said 75% of the people that go to them have never been saved. And the late Dr. R.A. Torrey, he went even beyond that. He said he believed that the number of lost people in Bible-believing churches was about 90%. Wow, that's a fantastic percentage. And I don't know what he based that figure on either. But 90% or 75%, take your pick, that's a tremendous percentage. And that's in Bible-believing churches. What about our own church? We've got about, we've got about three, four, five, I guess probably about 5,000 maybe people who come through these doors. And, you know, we come to, we have Sunday school classes. We got morning Sunday school classes, we got evening Sunday school classes, and on any given Sunday you will not find more than between six to seven hundred people that have come to Sunday school, Bible learning time, BLT. Now, the question I'd like to ask you is, why should we think that people who think studying the Bible here on earth is boring will become interested in the Bible when they get to heaven? Good question. You know, I tried to read the Bible before I got saved, and it was boring. <laughs> before I got saved, I, was, I purposed in my heart, yeah, I'm going to sit down and read the Bible, and it didn't last very long. It was boring. I couldn't understand it. You know why? Because I didn't have God's Spirit. And when you get saved, God quickens you by His Spirit, and He makes you a child of God, and the Bible becomes a living book to you. And that's what and the Bible says, to study to show thyself approved unto God. Study the word of God. Jesus said, search the scriptures. In the book of Acts, the men of Berea were more noble than they of Thessalonica. They searched the scriptures daily to see if these things, if these things were so. And so uh, the, the Christian is exhorted to read and study the word of God. People think... Uh, coming to BLT is, is boring, why should you think that they're saved? I wouldn't bet a counterfeit quarter on their salvation. They have no time to study the Word of God and they think it's boring. <laughs> and then, why should we think that people who don't care to learn about God while they're here on earth are suddenly going to want to know all about God when they get to heaven? I don't believe that for a minute. You know, um, there was an article in the paper just recently, if I can find it here. 
It was uh, about one of these big, here it is. It was about one of these big new mega churches. This is supposed to be the biggest one in America now. They come and go and, and so forth. It's totally um, uh, the, the Willow Creek type of a, of a church. I won't tell you which one it is, but it, it's, it's a real biggie. And their pastor is supposed to be uh, preaching, preaches to the largest congregation in the world. And this is an Associated Press article from back on July 16th of this past year. And they interviewed a lady that goes to this man's church. This is so sick. Here's what she said. Here's what she told the reporter. She says, the pastor gives me enough word, talking about the word of God, he gives me enough word to make it from 12.15 on Sunday to 10.45 the next Sunday. You poor, sick, deluded, starving woman. That is pathetic to come to church and to believe the pastor gets up to preach. He takes a spoon, spoonful of some spiritual mush or pablum, sticks it in your mouth, and that's going to last you till next Sunday. Don't you believe that for a minute? You say, well, Sunday school is kind of a kind of a new thing. It's only been around less than 200 years. Yeah, that's true. Sunday schools have only been around less than 200 years. But you know what happened before there was Sunday school? They used to go to church on Sunday morning and it lasted three hours. And then they were dismissed, went home and ate. Then they came back for a two-hour service on Sunday afternoon. Then they went home and ate again. Then they come back for another three-hour service on Sunday night. My grandmother was brought up in a church like that, and that was the norm back in those days. That was just, uh, she was born uh, during the Civil War. So th that was the norm a, a couple, uh, less than two centuries ago. No, they didn't have Sunday school, but man, they had preaching and teaching from the Word of God constantly on Sundays. Sunday school comes along, and it was to lessen the burden there, and teach the Word of God to God's people, God's people. So the pastor didn't have to do it all. Well, why should we think that people that don't care to learn about the Word of God while they're here on earth are suddenly going to want to learn about it in heaven? I don't believe that for a minute. What does God tell us? He tells us in Jeremiah 24, 7, I will give them a heart to know me. Talking about God's people. I will give them a heart to know me. God's people want to know about God. And that same verse goes on and says, they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Their whole heart. You know, we got so many half-hearted Christians today. It says they will return unto me with their whole heart. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They believe the word of God and they follow him. So, another question. Why would we think that those who are absentees now will want to be there later in heaven? There's no basis for that kind of, for that kind of thinking at all. People say, oh yeah, we go, but oh no, we haven't got time for Sunday school, all that stuff, you know. We're under grace. We just, we're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. We don't need all of that stuff. Boy, that's a sad, sad commentary on today's Christianity. If Lakin was right when he said 75%, or if Tory was right when he said 90% of church members are unsaved, um, he was right on, they were right on biblically. Now, you don't have to agree with that. But if you want to argue, argue with Jesus. Because here's what Jesus said. He said that there is going to be tares in with the wheat. He said the wheat are the good seed, the children of the kingdom. But he said the wheat is going to be overrun by tares, the counterfeit wheat. And he didn't stop there. He said that the same thing is true concerning the sheep. There's going to be goats in with the sheep. 
My sheep hear my voice. Yeah, that's true, but they're not all sheep. Some of them are goats. And we spend so much time and effort and money entertaining goats instead of feeding sheep that the church has turned into a theater. This type of a, th- this, this type of a thing. Jesus said the tares are going to be overrun, are going to overrun the wheat. Now what happens to all these lost church members? They're mentioned in scripture. These lost church members. When the rapture takes place, and that's what we're studying this morning, the rapture of the church. When the rapture takes place, there's going to be multitudes left behind. Multitudes of church members left behind. And they will be the deceived crowd that comprises the nucleus of the one world church of Revelation chapter 17. A great world church is going to be set up for the explicit purpose of worshiping the Antichrist. And where are all those, where's the nucleus for all of that, uh, uh, of that church to, to come into existence? Well, there'll be plenty of church members still here after the raptures of the church. When the rapture takes place, Church, the very next Sunday, church is go- a lot of church is going to be going, everything would just be going right on like nothing happened. Uh, you might find a few pastors missing, and you might, find a, you might lose a deacon or two, but by and large, church is going to be going right on, only the focus is going to be greatly changed. So, the first mention of the rapture in the book of, in the book of Romans, here's in, here in chapter 2, is the day when God shall judge the secrets of men's hearts by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And that's when every man shall have praise of God. But there's also that other day, the day of the Lord that he talks about here, warning lost people to get saved. The next mention of the rapture in the book of Romans is in chapter 8. And it has to do with with the concept of waiting. We are supposed to be waiting for the rapture. In Romans 8.11, this is on the next page of your notes there. In Romans 8.11, the Bible says, If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. He shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Now, this is not talking about salvation here. If you'll turn, please, to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we have the word quickened there. And in Ephesians 2, the word quickened is talking about salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's what happened when you got saved. God's spirit quickened your spirit. We're, we were dead in trespasses and sins, but were quickened by the Holy Spirit. So he quickened our spirit. That's where the Bible says that our spirit beareth witness with his spirit that we are the sons of God. What it's talking about in Romans is not the quickening of your spirit, it's the quickening of your bodies. It says this, uh, he's going to quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in in you. So that's not talking about salvation. This is talking about uh, res- resurrection here. It's going to be a tremendous change take place in our bodies. They're going to be quickened. Not just our spirit, that's when you get saved, but this is the body along with it. See, when a Christian dies, his soul goes to heaven. His body goes into the earth. But at the rapture of the church, both body, soul, and spirit are going to be quickened together. We're going to get a brand new body. This one is all just about all wore out. Can't do the things that it used to. And, and uh, every one of our mortal bodies starts out with infirmities anyways. They're all under the curse. At, when the rapture of the church takes place, it's going to be this brand new body that we're going to be given. And it's going to be a perfect body. And the scripture says we're to be waiting. This is what we're to do. Wait for the quickening of our mortal bodies by his spirit. That's Romans 8.11. Then in Romans 8.19, we have, 
we read about waiting, waiting again. Romans 8, 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. And that again is talking about the new resurrection body. We're going to get at the rapture. When the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord in a brand new resurrection body. The manifestation of our body is going to, is going to take place. And then again talking about waiting here for the rapture to take place is Romans 8.23. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, next word, waiting, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. And here again, it is talking about the rapture and the resurrection, which happen simultaneously. Notice it says we groan within ourselves while we're waiting. My grandmother, if she'd have lived two more months, would have been 99 years old. And um, the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years of her life, she used to sit in a chair in, the, in our home and, and um, groan. And my dad used to say to her, Mother, what's the matter? She says, nothing. And he says, well, why are you making all those noises? And she says, I'm not aware of making any noises. She just sit there groaning. Why was she groaning? Because her, her body was old. It was, it was wore out. And when you, get, when you get to be in your 90s, if you live that long, a lot of times people that old, they groan. Sometimes even before then, we, just, we groan within ourselves. The body is wearing out. It's, it's, it's run its course. And it says, we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, which is the redemption of our body. We're waiting for that brand new body. We get it at the rapture. When the rapture takes place, we get that brand new body. Turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We're going to look at a couple verses in Revelation. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. It says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, hooray, neither sorrow, good, nor crying, great. The former thing, I, I'm sorry, neither shall there be any more pain, no more pain either, no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain, for the former things are passed away. There'll be no more of those things. Those things are all connected with this mortal body. And this mortal body has, is going to pass away, but we're getting a brand new one. When the rapture takes place, we'll have a brand new body. Turn over a page in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3. Revelation 22 verse 3, There shall be no more curse. We are living under the curse today, the curse that was put on creation when man sinned. We're living under that curse today. But that curse is going to be lifted, and we're going to see this world and all, and all creation and all its beauty, and that's going to include our brand new bodies. There'll be no curse anymore to, to inflict pain or sorrow or death or crying or, or any uh, of these other things. And then, um, uh, turn with me if you also will, to the book of Philippians, the first chapter. He talks about this new body in the book of Philippians. And in chapter 1, verse 6 of Philippians, the scripture says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, that's salvation, he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day. Here's a... Remember, we saw two days there in Romans. This is the rapture, the day of Christ. He will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's begun the good work in us, and he's going to complete the good work that he began. God is not someone who starts things and doesn't finish them. He's going to complete them. When is he going to do it? In the day of Jesus Christ, or at the rapture. At the rapture, it's going to be complete. Go over to the third chapter of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3 
And verse 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a verse about the rapture. Verse 21, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working, whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Paul says at the rapture we're getting this brand new body, and it's going to be just like Jesus' body. Okay, so much for the waiting, the waiting out of mortality, the waiting for the manifestation, and the waiting and the moaning. All of those are mentioned in Romans chapter 8. And then we come to the next verse in Romans on the rapture, and that's in Romans chapter 11, right in the middle of the page there, the fullness of the Gentiles. Here's another rapture verse. Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. So here's something God wants us to know. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. The fullness of the Gentiles is the rapture of the church. The church is primarily a Gentile entity. And when the fullness of the Gentiles become in, and when that happens, it will be the completion of the body of Christ. The completion of the body of Christ. It's going to be the last soul that gets saved. The very last soul that gets saved. And when that last soul gets saved, it's going to trigger the rapture of the church. The fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now, Paul reveals a mystery in this verse. He, I should say solves a mystery in this verse. Why are the Jews so blind when it comes to Jesus? Do you ever wonder about that? How can the Jews possibly not believe on Jesus? I mean, they've got all the Old Testament scriptures and so forth. How can they be so blind? Well, we're told in Romans 11:25 that this blindness was inflicted, afflicted upon them by God. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. Why are the Gentiles so blind to Christ? Well, that's a totally different kind of blindness. We read about that in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded, lest they should, uh, the light of the gospel should shine upon them, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. That's the devil, the God of this world hath blinded. The, the Gentiles are blind concerning Christ because of blindness that comes from Satan, but the Jews are blind concerning Christ because of blindness that comes from God. And the reason that blindness came from God is that the waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in when the last soul is saved. After the last soul is saved and the church is raptured, God is once again going to turn to the, to the Jews. And the Jews are going to be his people during that next seven years of tribulation that's going to follow the rapture of the church. So the blindness to Israel is going to continue until the fullness of the Gentile fullness of the Gentiles come in. The last soul that gets saved is going to be added to the body of Christ. Now in Acts 2.47 we have a little inkling here about people coming into the church, becoming part of the church, which is the body of Christ. In Acts 2.47 the scripture says, praising God and having favor with all the people and then the last part of the verse says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It is God that is adding to his church. Now, the tares and the goats, they come in too. But it's the Lord that is adding to his church. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, Upon this rock I will build my church. It's not a pastor. It's not a denomination. It's not some organization of, of a seminary or Bible college or someplace. They don't build churches. Jesus builds his church. He said, I will build my church. And Acts 2.47 says that the Lord added to the church daily. 
such as should be saved. The membership of the true church is growing daily. Every day, God is adding people to his church. This might be the last day that God adds to his church. When that day comes, the last soul is saved. The rapture is going to take place and we'll be, we'll be gone. And we'll leave everything behind for the Antichrist. He's welcome to it. Everything else will be, will, uh, will be left behind here as the church is raptured up to glory. The Lord is adding to his church daily such as should be saved. It's, it's going on day after day after day. It's been going on since Pentecost. The Lord adding to his church. Notice right at the bottom of the page, Ephesians 2, 21 and 22. This is talking about the church. It says, in whom all the building fitly framed together, next word, groweth. Christians are to grow because the church is growing. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 2, grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord. If you're not a Christian that is not growing, you're a Christian that is out of the will of God. You're exhorted in the word of God to be growing. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. This is happening now, and it's been going on since Pentecost. The true church. The Lord's adding to it every day. When it's finished, it's going to be raptured. Now going to the next page, right at the top of the next page, Ephesians 3, 14 and 15 is still talking about the church here. It says, Paul says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family, the church family, the whole family. Where is the whole family? Well, he says, in heaven and earth. In heaven and earth. Jesus is the head. The church is his body. The head is up there in heaven. Most of the body is up there in heaven. Last 20 centuries, the body has been added to and has died and has gone to heaven. We're the, we're the part of it that's still left here on earth. We're the, we're the part that may be raptured because we believe that the rapture is close. And anyways, the whole family, the whole church family right now is partly in heaven, partly on earth. But when the rapture takes place, the whole family is going to all be up there together in heaven. For the first time, the whole family of God is going to be there in heaven at the rapture of the church. Then the next reference in the book of Romans to the rapture is in Romans chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. And he warns us here about the day... Remember, we, t we have the word, the, or the phrase, rather, the day. Sometimes it means the day of the Lord. Sometimes it means the day of Christ. Well, the, when it talks about it here in Romans 13, it's talking about the day of Christ, the rapture. It says, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, and here it is, the day is at hand. What is he saying here? The rapture is at hand. Now in the scriptures, in the gospels, we read about the kingdom was at hand. And that only lasted about four years where the kingdom was offered to Israel. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, but they rejected it. And the, king, and the offer was withdrawn and the kingdom was postponed. And God turned to the Gentiles, the church began. And he says concerning the rapture of the church, it's at hand. He wrote this over two, almost 2,000 years ago, and it is still pertinent and true today. Unlike the kingdom, which is not at hand anymore, the day of the Lord, I'm sorry, the day of Christ is at hand. Because the rapture is a signless, timeless event. It can happen at any time. No scripture has to be fulfilled first. Nothing has to come to pass. No prophecies have to be fulfilled. It can happen at any time, any given moment. So what is he, what is he telling the church here in Romans chapter 13? He's telling them to prepare for the rapture. 
Are you preparing for the rapture? Five things he says you need to do to prepare for the rapture. The first one is to wake up. He says, awake out of sleep. In Matthew chapter 13, where the, we have the parable of the tares in with the wheat. In Matthew chapter 13 and the 25th verse, the scripture says that while men slept, the enemy came in and planted the tares. While men slept, that's believers, while they slept. How'd the tares get in? Christians were asleep. Paul says, awake out of your sleep. Secondly, salvation is getting nearer. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. It's closer now than it used to be. Thirdly, the day is at hand. It's at hand. The time is here. Fourthly, cast off the works of darkness. In other words, separate from world and worldliness and worldly activities and, and sinfulness. Cast them off. And fifthly, put on the armor of light. Dress appropriately. Put on the armor of God, the armor of, of, of light. The reason is the day is at hand. And then the final reference in Romans to the rapture is in chapter 14. And we have three verses there that have to do with the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14 says, Why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Notice the word there, all. We're all going to stand. That's all the believers. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the first thing that's going to happen after the rapture. We're going to appear at the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. And then verse 12, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. So we labeled these three verses. Verse 10, assemble. We're going to assemble before the judgment seat. Verse 11, acknowledge. We're going to acknowledge God. And notice it says that every tongue shall confess to God. Now this is not talking about confessing sin. The judgment seat of Christ, your sin is all taken care of. That's under the blood. The confession that it's talking about here is the confession that we read about in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Confessing Jesus as Lord. This is the confession. We're going to stand before him and confess that he is our Lord. The Bible says also in the book of Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We're going to confess Christ that he is Lord. Is he your Lord? Going to, at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be asked to confess that he is our Lord. So verse 10 is to assemble. Verse 11 is to acknowledge. And verse 12 is to give an account. Verse 12 says, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. This is where the crowns are going to be handed out, all the rewards. It's going to be given out right here. Don't expect a martyr's crown if you don't die a martyr. That's a crown of life, it's a martyr's crown. Don't expect a soul winning crown, that's a crown of rejoicing, if you don't win souls. Don't expect a crown of righteousness if you don't live a faithful life. The crowns are all earned. They're not just gonna be given out indiscriminately like the first grade teacher that promotes everybody. They're gonna be given out, they're gonna be earned. They're gonna to have to be earned here. And so this is where the, the rewards are, are, are given out and where every man shall have praise of God. So this brings us to the close of the rapture in the book of Romans. Will you stand with me, please? And as you stand, if you will kindly look this way. 
as we leave this place today, may God be with each one of you, and may God help you to work on your crown. The five things that he tells us in Romans 13, to awake, salvation is getting near, the day is at hand, cast off darkness, put on the armor of light. May we do these things today. May God go with us and bless us as you work on your crown and as you lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. And may you get a full reward. May no man take your reward from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. You are dismissed.